Okay, I'll talk about some recent prog progress and automatic understanding of the visual world. So first of all, why is this a very hard problem? What the computer sees is a sequence of numbers, and then from there it has to go to interpret what's in the image. So it's actually it's far, far from trivial to go from this pixel representation to, for example, action recognition to see what are the actions in the image. As we've seen in the previous talk, there has been a lot of progress in recent years. So for example, nowadays, you have quite reliable results for recognizing faces in your camera, for example. You have, for, for self-driving cars, you can, in many cases, recognize pedestrians or obstacles on the road. As pointed out by Olivier, obviously there's no proof. You, don't, you cannot prove that you detect all of them, but the results are good and they can actually help at least for assisting drivers. Similar for video surveillance, you can actually see that if there's something happening, something dangerous happening, you can predict it. And then some other example is that you can search for images. For example, here is Google image search. You can search for the relevant images and get some information. And here another example, something which we cannot do today, which actually you would want to do, you have a video, and what you really would want to do is to auto-annotate what's the content of the video. So here on the left is something which a human has annotated, and on the right you can see the video, and that's really where we would want to go in the long term to really see here as the head waiter takes them to the table, they pass by the piano, and the woman looks at Sam, and so forth. So you really would want to see what's the content, and something where we really far. So what we can do today, we can do simple categories, but we cannot have a full reasoning of what's going on in the scene. Okay, and so what are, for visual perception, machine perception, and it similarly holds also for natural language processing, what are the different bricks? So they're machine learning tools. We have seen in the previous talk a lot of weight has been put in the recent years on deep learning, but basically we shouldn't forget there's other techniques around as well, such as large-scale learning. And then one thing is which is very important is actually the data. So if you take this machinery, what you really want to model, you want to capture what's the variability of the different categories and things in the scene, and so that's really important that you have the data. So there's, I'll go back to that in a moment, but there's manual annotation, weekly subordinate annotation, and synthetic data. And then once you have these two things, you can then construct visual models, and then the question is how to design these models, how to make them reliable, interpretable. Okay, so to come back to the training data, so a lot of weight has been put on this manual orientation. Okay, so now there's these large collections. If you go to the companies, all the companies, they have their set of raters. They annotate, they annotate, and they annotate. And so annotations are increasing complexity, image labels, bounding boxes, semantic segmentation labels, action labels. Okay, so here are a few examples. The first one was ImageNet, or one of the first ones was ImageNet. Then people have implemented Coco. Again, you have 80 optic class classes with 200 images, what you see, obviously you're far from annotating all the classes, you have a subset of classes for then which you get good results. And then another example that's joint work with people from Google and my group, and basically, so here we have annotated large number of actions, so we have 200,000 labels for a lot of 80 atomic actions, and if you look at that, the difficulty is how do you define these atomic actions? How do you do composite actions? And obviously you want to go away from annotating each and every action in the world. And if you think of actions, basically, you have all the interactions, you have interactions with objects, and it's clear that you cannot label this, so you really have to go to something more sophisticated than manually annotating everything. So it depends on your goal, but for me the long-term goal is really to go away from this manual annotation and annotate everything, because it's just like super cumbersome and will not give you a full way through, okay? And so another reason why you want to go away from these annotations, manual annotations, there are many things for which you cannot actually get manual annotations. So if you think of optical flow, you can just not annotate optical flow manually. So basically you cannot just click on each pixel and say what the optical flow is, or maybe a more convincing example is human 3D shape. So if you want to reconstruct human 3D shape, you cannot do this manually, right? So you have to have something which creates the data automatically, either by inferring it with big supervision or something which have, people have been looking recently at is using synthetic data. And so two ways out of this, one is weekly supervised learning. So basically here, the take is you have a lot of data which comes with metadata such as text, audio, user click data. You use this data to infer the labels in some weekly supervised way. So for example, here, one example which we have developed. So here we have videos which come with scripts. So here you have the video data. You can, for example, detect faces, and then what you want to do is you want to label the faces and say who is the person in the video, and what is the action the person is performing. 
And so here, the initial results are quite good, so you can actually label the phases quite well. You can detect some of the actions, but the main difficulty still remains in matching this text description to the image description reliably, right? So if for simple actions, simple phases, it works very well. So the technique which we have used is based on discriminative clustering. And then here, if you look at the results, so here for the phases, for example, you get good results. And obviously what we have inbuilt here, we have a human detector, which has been tree trained and detects the phases and the humans automatically. And then we can basically match the face names to the faces and some of the action labels to the, to the, to the motion of the people. And this is all then weekly supervised stress by taking the full annotations of the video clips and the videos. And then another example which we have developed recently, this is weekly supervised learning based on motion information. So it's pretty clear that motion information is a strong cue for learning. So basically here what we have is we segment out the moving objects in the video. We have annotations of an object which is contained in the video. And from there on, we can learn in an iterative way how to learn the labels, for example, here for the boat category, so semantic segmentation labels automatically. Okay, and so one of the things which you can see here, the boat is not segmented out perfectly, so motion segmentation by itself is still a hard problem. And so here, the approach which we have taken is a learning-based approach. So we have actually a synthetic data set of, of motion patterns. So we have this 3D flying objects data set, and what's actually interesting is here, it's totally artificial but it comes with precise optic, optical flow and motion segmentation masks. And from this data set, so it comes in a training and testing split, you can use then this data set and a unit-shaped architecture, segmentation architecture, to actually learn the motion patterns. So what's the rationale here is that the, the rationale here, why is it actually learning this motion patterns? I mean, it goes away from the traditional point-based matching things. Why is it learning the motion patterns, what it captures? It captures in a bottom-up and top-down way actually what's the local structure of the motion, right? So basically, if you have no motion or just a traditional motion, you learn these motion patterns. And if you are on the border of something, you learn the motion patterns, how the object moves with respect to the foreground. So that's like the intuition, why it works. And if you look at what the results are, so here, this is on the flying things on the synthetic data set, the test set, and the two, two top two results, of perfect optical flow, work very well, and if you look at the bottom row, what it, what's the problem? It's the same problem which you would have with classical computer vision techniques. The dominant object is much larger than the background, and so basically then it confuses background and foreground. So you have the same problems which you had before. So really you can see that basically here the receptive field is too large and it cannot really segment this out. And then here are a few results on real images. So here you can see the last row is the segmentation result, so it actually very well segments out <coughs> the moving objects despite noise in the optical flow extraction. And then one thing we have looked at is once you have this between subsequent images, obviously you want to go one step further and extract the moving segments for the full sequence. And so here, one method which can be used is to have recurrent networks. So it's here the gated recurrent units. And you can use these gated recurrent units to actually propagate the information through the sequence. So if you look at them a bit in more, more detail, what it does it actually captures the motion appearance information in one frame and then propagates this information with update and forget gates over the sequence. And here, the recurrent units, they're propagated on the full convolutional map. So you have the full convolutional map and you propagate the information on the full convolutional map. And this allows you to update the information over video sequence. And for example, if the object is not moving for a few frames, it still manages to propagate the information. And here, an example. So on the left, you see the motion stream, and, and on the right, the final result. So this would be the preliminary motion segmentation between two frames. You can see there are some mistakes. And then by integrating the information over the full sequence, you can see that you actually get very good results for this motion segmentation. Here another sequence, so this is the parkour sequence. You can see here on the left, just between frame-based estimation, you have these outliers for, for parts where the motion is very strong. And then by integrating over the sequence, you get good results, and this is the cat sequence. So even if the cat is not moving, you're still able to segment it out. And so why is this the case? Because we have a bidirectional recurrent network, so we go backward and forward. So basically, Anywhere in the image, you can backward and forward propagate it. And one difficulty, if the motion stops for too long of a time, 
the network starts to forget, right? So these recurrent networks, they're not, they not resistant. If there's no motion for a very long time, it just starts forgetting, forgetting, and doesn't update it anymore. So that's something which we're currently looking at. You would need another, an external memory unit to store the information. Okay, and then, so basically, as I said, so all these weekly supervised things, they're good, but basically, if you want to go to more complex things, for example, 3D reconstructions of humans, basically, the one idea we had or one thing we were trying out is to use synthetic humans, so to create data sets of synthetic humans. And so here, this is trying to work with colleagues from MPI, so they have very good tools for reconstructing these 3D human shapes. And here, the idea is to create these different shapes, animate them with different mocap data, and then put them in some scene, for now the scene is just a static background, and use this data then to infer the training labels. So what do we have? We have a human body, we have mocap data, so mocap data is for example the CMU bit mocap data where people are walking around and running in the scene. Then what we can generate, we can generate, we have different types of clothing, different types of backgrounds, we can change the camera position, we can change the lighting. And so what we get then is this 3D scenes with humans in them, and for the, those humans, we have all the ground truth annotations, right? We have the pose, the 2D, 3D pose. We have the depth map, which means we have the shape, the voxels, everything. We have the flow and the part segmentation. So here, just a few details on how we create a data set. We have this Caesars data set for human body shapes, so it's a large data set for human body shapes. We have different types of backgrounds, different types of motion captures, and then we can create this large number of video sequences. And here, just to look at a few results. So the results are not completely perfect. You can see the humans, they're quite good. What we don't have, we don't have a good background right now. They're just superposed on images. So that's good enough for, for training the network, right? Because it doesn't really care the interaction of the background, but obviously you would want to insert them in a real 3D scene, something we're currently working on. You can also see that, for example, the hands and the feet, they're not perfectly modeled, so that's something also people are looking at how to create better hand models, which is important, for example, for object hand interaction. But you can see that you have very good ground truth and the humans, they look quite realistic. And then as a proof of concept, the proof of concept, we have built up this stacked hour class network, which gets 2D pose and segmentation. And you can then show that basically by testing it on a small data set, I won't go into the details, we can show that by combining, having the real the synthetic data, we get better results than just using the real data set if the real data set is very small. By combining the two of them, we improve further performance. You can really show that the synthetic data help, and in particular it helps if you don't have a lot of real data, right? So it's always this compromise, if there's no real data, then synthetic data helps a lot, and the real data can help to fine tune or further improve the performance of the model. And then, here you can see some results. So we actually get this like real images from YouTube and you can see that actually here we could get good body part segmentation. Here it's only trained on, re on synthetic data. So even just training on synthetic data, we get relatively good results on this real data. And so something, I don't have any slides on that, but we have been looking at re recently is actually going, using this data to get full 3D reconstruction of the human body. And so there, one, the, one of the questions was, what is the best representation? So we compared voxel-based representation, point-based representations, and model fits. So you can just have a parameters model of the human. And actually, we also found that we got empirically best results for the voxel-based representation. But I guess it's just like a way of how you set up the network and how you parameterize your training data, right? Because intuitively, you would think that if you have a model representation, you would get re better results, right? And then basically, so once we have this data and the machine learning, so then there's a lot of approaches we've seen in the previous talks for images. So there's results for object detection, segmentation, semantic segmentation, image captioning. So then what you want to do is to automatically generate captions for images. And one thing which also works quite well is reconstruction of the scenes, something also we have seen in the previous talk. And then I'll just go a bit more into details on action recognition, so one thing actually we have been looking at actively is action recognition, so people in general look at action classification, so what they do is they assign a label to a clip, so they want to know what's going on in the clip. That's useful if you want to do, for example, search on YouTube and things like that, but then in the long term what you really want to do, as I said in the beginning, you really want to understand where the people are, how they interact, and what's the interaction with the environment and among themselves, so you want to really localize where they are on what the actions are. And so the different 
steps here, which most of the state of the art uses. They first operate on the frame level to detect actions in the frame level, then track them based on instance and class level tracking, for example, over the video, rescore them, and do temporal detection to really say at which moment in time which action is performed. And so here it is. One of the initial approaches, this is an extension of faster RCNN to two streams, so using appearance and optical flow, basically you extract proposals from the RGB frames and then classify them to see what the pose of the human is capturing. And the second stream is use optical flow field, so you set a set of optical flows and you predict based on these optical flows what the action is and then you can combine the two scores, right? And the this works quite well, but the problem here is that you only look at the frame level, right? And ideally, what you would want to do is you would want to look at a whole sequence of frames to say, for example, here is the person sitting down or is it standing up, right? To make the difference between these two actions. And so this, as you see here, for example, here, if you see the whole sequence, you can really see if the person is sitting down on the top or standing up on the bottom. So you can really make the difference. And so this is an approach which we have recently implemented. So what we look here, we take not only frames, but we take these anchor cuboids. And each of these anchor cuboids is a set of frames which are concatenated, classified, and then regressed. So basically, once we have this fixed rigid cuboid, we can perform regression on it. And the regression is actually quite nicely. It follows the action around in the sequence. So how does it work? It's based on a region, recent <coughs> framework, which is the simple zero-shot single shot detector, which actually has these multiple convolutional layers, outputs the detections at different scales at multiple convolutional layers. And then you take this thing over the sequence, take the output at the different layers. So for example, here, this would be one output for one resolution, the, the red one, I don't know if you can see it, the red one here, no, you cannot see it, the red one here. And then you basically concatenate them together, right? So this one, this one, and this one. Then you concatenate them together, this final layer. And this final layer is fed into another set of classifiers, which output then the classification score and the regression score. So basically, and the weights here, to make it simpler to converge, the weights here are shared. So you have the shared weights here get the output at different scales, so each of these different levels will be different scales, and for each scale you concatenate the features over the set of frames, then you have another set of feature la classification layers, and then you get the classification and the regression output, where the regression output are the coordinates for each of the frames, which would be four times the number of frames which you use, okay? And then for a given anchor cuboid, which is rigid in space-time, you can then basically get a classification score, but you also get this regress tubelet, right? And the regress tubelet really learns how to make the, 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 to align better with the action. So you get a much better localization of the action in space time, and you get a much better improved classification score. And if you look here in yellow, the correct, the, the, in, in green, the ground truth, and in yellow, the detections. So here, this would be, for example, correct detections for horseback riding, and you can actually see there's actually the, no, not much difference between the ground truths and the detections, right? So it's actually per almost perfect. In some cases, you can look at the detections which we obtain are actually better than the annotated ground truth. So this is a relatively small data set of 30 actions. It's all sports actions, but you can see that they're nicely detected and actually it really ma manages to find the correct outline in the image very precisely. And so what we do is we have this small detection tubelets, and then the tubelets are linked over the video sequence, right? So basically the, the classification is done in 10 frames consecutively, and then these consecutive ch small chunks are linked together to, to track the action through the video. So here are two failure cases. So the first failure case is actually that here, in this case, the precise localization is not given. And then the second case here, you can see that two persons are interacting, and, and there actually the problem is that it doesn't really localize them very well, right? Basically, the thing is still based on this anchor cuboid, and if you have two people, it's not able to separate the two people out. And the first thing which I showed was the temporal localization. So basically there, what you want to say is at which point precisely the person is shooting the ball into the basket. And here again, the representation is not fine enough because you just have this cuboid and you classify what's going on in the cuboid, so it's really hard to tell what is the precise moment in time 
where a person is shooting into the ball. And so here, one idea which we have is to improve this is to actually go to a finer representation and go back, go further and really use the human pose and not just this angle cuboids, right? If you had the human pose, so here you could really say the person is taking the, the cleaning tool out of the basket and is then moving it around. And so this is one of our recent results for 3D human pose recognition, reconstruction. So you can really see on the left, the 2D pose, our output of our approach is 2D pose and 3D pose. And if you look at it, this can give you an additional idea how people are interacting with the world and with the objects, right? So for now, we don't have final results for recognition, but we do have these results for interaction with the world. And I guess that would be one answer to the dancer, so you could really see how the two people are dancing together. And so here, just very briefly, what's the approach? So here the approach is based on a set of anchor poses, so each of the humans is classified in a given anchor pose. Then you have some regression network, so you basically you have three losses, the loss of localizing the human, the loss of classifying the pose in a given pose class, which gives you a rough idea what's the pose of the person, and then a regression loss, which adjusts the, the joints to the actual image data, right? Because the, the pose classification just gives you a rough approximation, which you then want to line to the pose data. And then here, the loss, the loss would be the lo this localization loss, the classification loss, and the and the regression loss, which are combined and then trained end to end. And then here, some results, so you can actually see <coughs> we do manage to find the three B pose precisely, and and even in case of occlusion, we may manage to hallucinate the three D pose very accurately. Okay, and so in conclusion, we have seen that for now we get very good results for a lot of vision problems, but obviously there's also a lot of problems which we haven't solved. One thing which, measure, which, we, which men was mentioned before, we don't have any confidence about how good our results are. If we want to go to higher level interactions, it's something we cannot do either, right? We can have like simple object detectors, simple classification scores, but we don't have any real high level intelligent understanding of the scene. Something which is still important is the sign of new models, right? It's pretty clear that we just, we cannot just have like these deep learning models which are just convolutional layers with some output. We have to have some other higher level representations such as like recurrent networks obviously, but also then some ne memory ne networks and things like that. We've seen that it's very important to think about what kind of training data we need. I mean, we have all this complex visual world and basically we have to think what's good training data and for example, if you think of actions, if you don't have a good set of training examples, you cannot go to full representation, right? I mean, for objects, maybe it's simpler, but if you have these human actions, it's clear that if you don't have appropriate training data, you cannot learn good models. And then one thing which is also, I haven't talked about this, but which is also very important is inc incremental learning. So today, most of the systems, they just take the data and train the system for, from scratch every time they have a few no new classes. And so if you want to do this incremental learning, you would like to add classes on the fly. And that's something for neural networks. If you do that, there are tricks, obviously, how to do it. But in many cases, they start to forget what they have seen before. right? So if you just add classes on the fly all the time, they start forgetting. And so what you have to do is to think of structures, how to preserve the information at the same time as adding new classes. And the same thing is something which would be very interesting to have some general representation of low-level features, right? Right now, you just retrain your network every time you get new data, and every time you get these new representations. But what you really would want is to have something which gives you something which we had before. Like before, we had these interest points with features, and this was like set in stone. And now we have to retrain every time, which is something we can do if you're application-oriented, but if you want to have some more generic system which can like run for a long time, you would want to have some features which are generalizable, right, which can be transferred without fine tuning from one data set to the other. And then one thing in the long run is also, which is also important, is to go beyond just using one modality, but to integrate different modalities. So by integrating, it's not just like putting the one next to each other, so all the multimodal systems which are around today, they just combine the, the representations and stack them together, but what you really want is some more deeper interaction between these different modalities in order to really have this concept of learning, right? If you look at what humans do, they learn really how to process this data jointly and use this information. For example, what we showed with the weekly supervised learning, how to process this information jointly to update the network over time. And the last point, which we've seen in the, pre the previous talk, is to go towards interaction with the world. So basically, I think 
like 20 years ago, all these robotics things didn't really work because the vision systems, they didn't output any relevant information. Now I think we have sufficiently good visual tools that we can actually, we can start to reinteract with the world. And this will also give us some updated representation of how to represent categories, right? In the end, what we would want is not only to have a visual representation, but have a representation how, for example, about the physics of the objects, right? And for that, we need to touch, for example, the objects and see well, how, are they soft, are they hard, how to interact, and this will give us some additional knowledge of how to represent the full visual world. Okay, thank you for your attention. All right, uh, we have time for questions. Yeah? Uh, Olivier Fogeras. Okay, Cordelia. Uh, and then uh, Jean maybe, uh, maybe I missed some, something, but I didn't see any part played by attention in your, in, in your technique. Attention focusing on something important in the scene. You, you seem to be to try to be trying to be exhaustive in your description. Yeah, this uh, is am good, I correct? Or yeah, this is a good question. So basically, obviously, we have this, if you think of faster RCNN, it kind of selects regions which have some kind of object, which is, I could, you could say, it's some kind of attention mechanism, right? But I'm kind of very reluctant to this attention idea because in many cases you miss information, right? So basically, obviously, yeah, there are all the saliency maps which you can learn, but then, I mean, either you learn it and the whole thing is end-to-end, -end, then yes, then it's like a speed up, okay. or otherwise you just lose information. So it's kind of, it's a trick. For me, it's a complete, it's not, I mean, I, I know humans do use attention, right? But for me, it's kind of a computational trick to speed right. up. And if you look at what this faster RCNN does, or all these methods, they actually do, do some pre-processing of where to process next, right? So basically, this is exactly what they're doing. Or if you look at cascades, it's like a computational attention mechanism. So what I'm kind of, what I don't like is this human modeling the human attention and then saying this is exactly what we want. So my take is more look at what the computer is supposed to do and then model this. And the attention there is really where to process next, right? And this is what we're exa exactly what we're doing, right? By doing this cascade approaches, for example, if you should think of the real out Jones cascade, it says this is very likely to have the face, and then you go from there. And this is, it's like an engineering attention, right? It's not a human attention, and I would say from an engineering point of view, that's what I would do, I mean. Jean-Paul Lemour. Uh, is that possible to, to integrate some uh, a priori knowledge on the motion coming from instance from uh, biomechanics, saying that uh, the motion is not at random, there, are, there is a structure of the motion coming from the synergy, the, the, the biomechanic, uh, biomechanical synergy of the body, and then some motion invariant. Then is that possible to introduce that kind of uh, uh, parameter invariant in the data processing uh, uh, tunnel you are using. Is that easy? It would be easy to integrate that kind of a priori knowledge to improve the recognition, to improve to... In the data generation or in, yeah. the, in the data generation yeah. and the recognition? Yeah, in the data generation, it's clear you can... No, in the, in the, the recognition, recognition process. In the recognition. in the recognition process. That means that saying, for instance, uh, this hypothesis is impossible because it is in contradiction with the uh, synergy, the well-known synergy uh, we, we, may, we may have, for instance, uh, with the hand. When we grasp an object, there are some fundamental synergy, very few, and then uh, it's not possible to grasp an object with some uh, a priori motion. So I could see doing it as some post-processing or some parallel verification, but to integrate it in the network, I, I don't know, I mean, this is something, it's a good question, I think. It, it would be to, I mean, the, the feeling will be just to cut in the complexity of the problem uh, and to make a, a reduction of the space of the search. So what you could do is you could have some multi-stage network. So for example, that you predict intermediate steps, right? I think that, that would be something maybe which would be something which, I mean, would co correspond to your question. So what we did, for example, when we estimate the human body shape, we first estimate the pose and then the shape. So you could do something similar. You could first have some intermediate representation I don't know what it would yeah. be in your case, but maybe just some, some joints, joint angles, and then mm -hmm. you could have some verification of these joint angles and then mm -hmm. do the final computation. Mm -hmm. I think this is something which, 
which is, I mean, I haven't talked about it, but which is kind, kind of interesting to not learn the full problem, but to learn intermediate representations, maybe get some additional training data to learn the intermediate representations, maybe this verification. I mean, you can even build in hard knowledge, right? If you have the knowledge, I mean, I think nothing, nothing prevents you to building in some hard knowledge, right? So you could put in this hard knowledge, whatever it is, and then go on, right? And then you could have some end-to-end -end training and train up the full system. Claude Béraud, right here. Yes, this is a question that could have been asked to the previous speaker also. Uh, your, the, the neural networks have a lot of hyperparameters. How do you choose them? You mean the architecture of the networks? Yeah, for instance, the, the parameters of each layer. Uh, so you mean not the, par not the parameters, but you mean the architecture, right? Like how many filters well, do you have? Well, the architecture is, is easy to define, but at each level of the network, in each layer, you have several parameters. Uh, activation function, uh, bias, uh, length, size of the, of the layer. And do you think that there is a common set of hyperparameters for all the applications, or you have to choose different? So for the moment, I think this is like the, the thing which is completely hand-tuned. So basically everybody, is hand I mean, this is like the thing which, which is not learned, but hand-tuned, right? In deep learning, this is the thing which is hand-engineered. Like for each problem, people look at the problem and then they engineer the network, right? For example, if it's a simple problem, you take three layers. If it's a harder problem, you take 100 layers. And, and so basically everybody, yeah. Everybody is, is there this. a method to choose the, these parameters? For now, no. For now, it's the, what I'm saying. It's like it's like design choices, right? I think this is like the thing which is which is quite ugly about these deep learning methods is that you just you go ahead, you you, val you validate on your validation side, and you say this works and this doesn't work. So it's completely empirical, right? And so there are now methods which try to learn this things like automatically, but they always have some way of enum enumerating different architectures, right? Because there is no, theor I mean, there's absolutely no theoretical guarantee on how to set up a neural network given of the problem. I mean, what you can do, what we have looked at recently, is you can actually measure the complexity of your problem and the complexity of the network, right? So this gives you kind of an idea of how deep the network has to be or how many parameters you want, right? If it's like a problem, if you want to do, I don't know, it's a simple problem, we can have, we have a very simple complexity, you can say basically my network needs to be not very complex. So that's the only thing which people have been looking at recently, that to measure the complexity of the network on the problem and try to match that. But then once you have this, you can still have like more depth or more width, so you can really have a lot of this vari variability. So and this is like something which is absolutely unclear. Yes? Yes, please. Uh, uh, in your Excel, uh, Excel recognition network, uh, you use the multiple CNNs working in at different time, and then you combine this, uh, integrate this visual to come up with uh, action recognition. So it integrates over several frames, right? Yeah, several frames. Yes. Uh, so you also when you integrate uh, several frames, uh, why did you think of uh, let's you use some sort of recurrent? Uh, Network or LSTM, whatever, to so for now. Some, so this is yeah. This is two things. So basically, at the low level, we just integrate it mm -hmm. over several frames. And if you have developed another technique recently, where instead of just using a set of two D convolutions, you can also use three D convolutions, right, to integrate to measure the performance in the tube. Instead of just having these two D filters, which you can concatenate, you can also have three D filters, which actually further improves the performance a bit because you measure even better what's going on the low level. And then if you want to add something recurrent, <coughs> what we're doing is we're adding that on top of it, right? So basically you have this low level primitives, which gives you like locally in space time, these action cuboids, which we would, I mean, which we could actually call some kind of attention mechanism, right? Which puts the attention to this like low level primitives. And then basically on this low level primitives, you can and put some recurrent network which kind of predicts how this thing performs over time. So this is like an additional step which you can put on top of this. And this is something you need if you have longer videos, right? For so this very short videos, you don't really need it, but if you want to model, like for example, how something performs in full video to localize like the performance of full video, then you can use these recurrent architectures 
to improve the performance. And this being said, these recurrent architectures, they're kind of having a very similar function of to smoothing the results, right? So they're not really learning that much. So, so what they're doing is they're just propagating the information over time and it's very, very simple, similar to smoothing, basically. They're not learning more, at least for now, they're not learning more than smoothing. So that's, I think it's an interesting question. How do you model this temporal structure over time in a better way than just having this recurrency? Stefan Müller, Stefan Müller. Yes, uh, I was wondering, it looks like you're using progressively less and less prior information, like for example, uh, struct, uh, rigidity of motions and all these notions that have been very much studied in vision are progressively forgotten and replaced by lots of data. How, I, I didn't even understand whether you were really you separating uh, optical flow or whether you were letting the network basically learn optical flow from 3D structure. My question is, what kind of prior information you believe are still very relevant for learning facing this huge amount of data? And what do you try to capture in your system as a prior information on the scenes, physics, and whatever? Yes, yeah, so I guess the, I mean, like a very high level answer to this question is the prior, prior knowledge can actually replace the data, right? So basically, I think if you That's have enough the data, level. then you can actually you can get rid of the prior knowledge, and if you don't have enough data, then you have to build in all this prior knowledge. And, and so I would say, I mean, maybe it's like a risky claim, but I would say in the long term, I think, I mean, this prior knowledge is like very handcrafted. So I think if you go towards the data, I think you have maybe a better capture on what's going on. And, but we do have like methods of capturing the prior knowledge, right, for the optical flow. So we still don't have this end-to-end -end trainable system, but that's something we're looking at. I think cl clearly that's something you want. You don't want to separate things out, right? You don't want to have this prior knowledge. And where we use it, for example, is for the motion segmentation in 3D. There you can have prior knowledge of you want to find a human, for example. So there we would say what I want is this human, for example, this example of the parametric model. So you have this shape parametric models, like whatever, the, the pose, where you separate out the pose and the shape. So this is where we would use, still use the parametric model, for example. And again, we didn't see as much gain as you would expect, right? I think it's really this trade-off between data and the parametric model. So it's very clear these things work much better. If I give you only a few examples, it was clear it will work much better, right? If you give you enough data, then it's not so clear. I think it's something where you can really measure this trade-off. And so I don't, I don't have a good answer. Do you want these parametric models, this prior knowledge, or do you just want to generate more data? I mean. I think it's kind of equivalent. It's nicer to have the, the prior knowledge from a computer vision point of view. It's clear that's what we're used to, right? But then, I mean, and the other example where we use it is that we say that the motion is rigid. So if you do this 3D scene reconstruction, we say that the motion, the moving bodies are rigid, but it's actually probably a limitation of the system, right? Because what you really would want is to model any kind of motion you don't want. I mean, again, it depends, right? If, you want to, if you're a car manufacturer and you want to localize cars, then you want to assume that it's rigid. But other than that, if you have this general thing, you just want to have non-rigid objects. So I think it's, it's an open question, but it seems to be that data is actually probably in the long term, a bit, I mean, a better solution, but it's like just my claim. I don't know. I have no proof for that. So, thank you very much.